decided that because when uh, Tom regenerated to Peter, Peter was kind of enervated and, and had to be carried around and regeneration had kind of wiped him out for a few right. um, episodes, then, that they decided that regeneration with me would turn me manic. It would kind of flip my lid and right. make me you know, behave in an extraordinary way. So there was all that straggling of Perry and, yeah. and seeing imaginary demons and being spooked by stuff and apparently being cowardly because he wasn't himself at that point. Which was a bit tough for the viewers to take yeah. because their really nice, gentle fifth doctor with his stick of celery and his floppy hair and his youth and his handsomeness and his kind of protective demeanour to his companions turned into this ravening madman who was trying to strangle his beautiful assistant. Mm. Um, so it's not surprising really that people went, not sure about old Sixty. <laughs> not, <laughs> not keen on him really. Even despite that very last shot, yeah. I am the doctor whether you like it or not, and the smile which Nicola and I agreed we needed to give the audience you know, a something to latch on right. to over the next six months when they were waiting to see more. So we wanted to give a promise of future improvement. Right. Um, but uh, it was a bit slender for some people, I yeah. think. Well, it's sort of a long game intended for your character. So it would be sort of like Mr. Darcy. Yeah, the, the sort of the That's the example I always give. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think he's one of the most interesting characters yes. in fiction. Because for the majority of Pride and Prejudice, I'm sure you know the book, uh, the majority of Pride and Prejudice, everyone in the book, and you reading it, think that Darcy is a self-important prig who hasn't got any decent human emotion at all. In fact, he's probably the only really decent person in the story mm. who is prepared to allow himself to be traduced for the sake of protecting others. And he's a, he's a wonderful character, Darcy. And I, I did actually say to John Nathan Turner that I liked that element. Yeah. I liked stripping away layers until you... It's much more interesting. Yes. If you find out everything about somebody when you first meet them, what is there left to find out? True. But if you're always finding out new things, and the new things are people you like, predominantly, yeah. uh, it's more interesting than meeting somebody you really like and finding they're awful afterwards. I'd rather, a lot of my closest friends in life have been people that I was quite unsure about when I first met them. Right. And gradually you grow to like a person and realise that under that <coughs> unappealing exterior, there beats a heart of gold. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather have dressed like Mr. Darcy as the doctor? I'd rather have been dressed like Christopher Eccleston. <laughs> That was the costume I asked for. Really? I, they said, what would you like? I said, well, it strikes me that the doctor is really keen on keeping a low profile while he goes about doing the things that the doctor typically does. He might wish to fade into the background on occasion. What do they give me? <laughs> oh yeah, fade into the background in that. <laughs> Unless you're in a tartan factory <laughs> and you're on acid, <laughs> you, you haven't got a chance. So what was your reaction the first day you actually got to see the coat in, in, up, up close and personal? I got inside it as fast as I could so I didn't have to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> the only consolation I had was that my dear Nicola, my long, longest companion, um, we were always on the horrible locations where it was freezing, so she'd always say, can I snuggle under your coat to get warm? <laughs> and reluctantly I'd allow her to. Good compensation, sir. It's a hard life being a doctor. <laughs> but I really did describe, literally, what Christopher Eccleston got. Right. And the other thing I said is, why does the doctor have to have a costume? Mm. Why can't he wear clothes, like other people. So he dresses appropriately as to where he is, yes. like the TARDIS is supposed to do, but doesn't. But of course it's much cheaper to have a TARDIS that remains looking like the beloved police box, because you build one and it lasts you for 50 years. <laughs> and ditto with the costume, you get one costume for a doctor and it lasts you a whole series. Certainly with mine, which is very expensive. <laughs> I wanted to ask about um, 
your decision to become an actor? Well, because I understood you didn't you weren't didn't initially train for that. You you, you started in another in another career. Well, I started as a baby. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little baby, <laughs> and then I grew up, and acting first came in my direction when I was 11 years old at school, all right. at an all-boys school in Manchester, all boys. Um, thank you for those of you who were here last night. Um, and we did a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta every year. Um, and a couple of my friends thought that was quite fun to do, so I went along and joined them and found to my surprise that I was playing Phyllis in Iolanthe. <laughs> Phyllis is the lead soprano. Right. Um, and, and the love interest for a, I was in, well I was 11, and my, my Strephon, who was my boyfriend, was 15 I think. And we sang love duets to each other. Um, and my English teacher, who had a fairly mordant wit, wrote a review in our school magazine saying Colin Baker threw himself with great verve into the part of Phyllis <laughs> and rarely strayed more than half an octave from the note. 